Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Maryland Native Plant Society's webinar on non-native earthworms and their effects on temperate forest soils with Dr. Caitlin Slavitt. I'm Ann DeNovo, and I'll be your host this evening together with my co-host, Lynn Parsons, Dr. Caitlin Slavitz, who is a research professor at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore in the Department of Planetary and Earth Sciences. At JHU, she teaches courses in global environmental change, general ecology, and soil ecology. Her research interest is in the soil ecosystem, particularly soil diversity, and the role of biota in carbon and nitrogen recycling in the soil. Her research focus is on human-altered landscapes such as crop fields, secondary forests, and the urban environment. She is a research associate at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, and she is a co-founder of the Global Urban Soil Ecology and Education Network or glucine. And with that, Kathy, I am going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Thank you for the introduction. And this is an amazing crowd. So thank you for participating. I, I guess it indicates a strong interest in this topic my research is focusing on, or some of my research is focusing on. Uh, I believe this is my third uh, talk for the Maryland Native Plant Society, third or the fourth one. Last time I talked in DC in a library, and it was six, seven years ago. So I looked up that presentation, I was able to find it. And I'm hoping that I will be able to, to show you some of the slides will be still there because they are general introductory slides. And so with this large audience, I, I, I assuming it will be new for most of you, but I also hope I will be able to share some new information, some new data for you. First of all, I'd like to just you know, touch upon uh, what I'm going to talk to you tonight. I'll uh, talk uh, about land use history because it's an important component of this invasive earthworm story. A little bit of introduction of why soy organisms and earthworms are important. And then I'm going to talk about what we call the first and second wave of earthworm invasion. Uh, I also want to mention, obviously, some of these data are sort of have been accumulating for decades now, and it's a result of, of fantastic collaborations with the, the U.S. Forest Service, colleagues from the Soil Conservation Society, the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, and of course, my student, my collaborators in the uh, Hungarian Museum of Natural History and uh, my students who, who did a lot of the, the field work and lab work. First, why so is it important? And this is probably a group of people whom I don't have to emphasize why soil and soil health is important. But if I ask people, most people will still say, well, soil is important because we grow things in it. And whether we grow things for food or we grow flowers because, you know, we like it. Uh, that's just one of the many different functions or ecosystem services that soils provide us. One of them is obviously decomposition and nutrient cycling. So uh, all the processes in terrestrial systems that essentially make the nutrients that the plants need available to them take place in the soil. Soil is placed to this enormous diversity, which I'll talk about. But we also have to sort of zoom out and think about on a global scale how soils are important, mitigating, for instance, flood conditions, because they absorb, depending on soil condition, they can absorb a lot of water. Today is a, a, a good it's unfortunately a good day to talk about it with regard to Hurricane Ida or the, it filters waters, it, it obviously sec potentially it's a great place to se sequester carbon. And then we have other cultural and architectural uses or functions of soils as well. Naturally, soil formation is a long process. And generally, these are the five factors that determine what kind of a soil we have. So what is the, the parent material, the rocks, 
are we in a slope? You know, how much, what is the climatic conditions? Is it dry, wet, cold, or warm? Uh, how long this process has been going on? And so what I'll focus is on, on organisms. And so organisms in this case are two different category. So we have the organisms which are in, you know, make their living uh, or make soils in the habitat and uh, make their living there. But there are also these other organisms, which is our species, which has an enormous influence of which way soil development is actually going to go. And so especially recently now we talk a lot about how human activities affect this naturally but relatively slowly occurring process of soil formation by changing the land surface, removing the topsoil, removing the vegetation, changing the land use, adding stuff to the soil, either in terms of amendment, irrigating, or selectively changing the plants and the soil organisms, you know, promoting certain things we want them and eliminating certain things which, which we don't. So humans definitely have an enormous influence on how, what we see when we take, especially uh, a sample of surface soils. Now in North America, one of these major or most influential effects was deforestation. So I'm sure most of you are aware that you know, naturally the eastern half of, of North America, or at least the US, is the natural or native vegetation cover is forests of different kind, which by the by the turn of the 20th century were you know essentially cut down, clear cut for the most part. And although some of these forests have regrown. These forests are not necessarily the same as they were before you know, European settlement. And I want to emphasize that because I, I have a lot of questions about you know, native plants and the native, what is the native conditions. And the forests that we see today are, are for the most part are very different what they were back then, including the soils and soil conditions. Now, obviously, that's also very visible in our, you know, closer neighborhoods. This is the Baltimore, Washington, greater Baltimore, Washington metropolitan area, which again, you can see that some of these or most of these the forest clearing was related to converting the landscape to agricultural fields, and which is the orange, which was then gradually diminishing and gave way to increasing forest cover, which is the green, but at the same time, in the most you know, recent de decades, to urban and suburban development. So again, what we see, especially here, essentially most forests are what we call secondary forests, which were grown or developed abandoned agricultural land. A lot of my research or our research focusing on what is the legacy, what can we see in the soil, especially on surface soils, with regard to these various past land uses. Most of my studies uh, trying to answer these questions take place or took place or has been taken place for, for two decades at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, or CERC, which as you can see, uh, at least in the upland area, uh, is essentially forest cover. So the bird's eye view will tell you that these are forest, forested areas. And, but as I will show this, what it, you, you know, appears as like a continuous forest cover. It's actually a patchwork of different forest types. So those of you who don't know, but I'm sure most of you know, Cirque is uh, just south of Annapolis, about, about five miles maybe, something like that, in Edgewater, Maryland. And so in this forested area, we have a lot of research sites where we took lots of soil samples, analyzed soils, earthworms, and been monitoring these the locations for some time. And so in order to see what the, the land use history legacy might be, of course, we need to know what the land use was, not just simply say, okay, so this was cropland. So we using, trying to, you know, find old maps and overlaying them and using written and, and oral histories, we try to see how, what these sites that we are taking our samples or sort of taking a closer look on, what is their actual history 
in the past, you know, 100 years or so. I want to mention that CERC, uh, this area called uh, Java Farm, is one of the oldest agricultural areas in the eastern um, United States. So even the 16, early 1600s, this was already a farm. What is the legacy? So what we divided this forested area into were three different patches or three different categories. What we call uncut forest, which have never been cut based upon what we know about the land use history. We look at old forests, which are at least 150 or 200 years old. And we have young girl forests, they're not really young, but 70, 80 year old for 80 year old forest patches. And so we're looking at the soil profile and the soil samples analyzing a lot of things. And so again, looking at, even if you just take a soil core and look at the soil profile, you see immediately the differences in, in, a, in a patch that has never been disturbed and, and one which was you know, used as an agriculture field for tobacco, corn, different crops. And then in the past, before it was abandoned, which was in the seventies or so, some of them earlier, a dairy farm. So you can see these, this is a lot more, you know, mixed up. You don't see these horizons that I showed you. And we assume that the pre-colonial soil must have looked something like that, okay? So if we take a closer look of some of these soil properties, and so I have three categories. I have this young forest, old and uncut. It's just a number of, of uh, stands that we were examining. Young forests have higher bulk density, which means they are more compacted. They have more calcium. They are less acidic, so they have higher pH. They have less aluminum and than the old forests and less than, much less than, um, than the uncut forest. In terms of carbon content, because of the surface organic or O layer, which is present only in the uncut soils, but not on the other two, this has the highest carbon content. The other sort of clear indication of past agriculture and differences is the depth, what we call the depth of the B horizon. So in a typical soil profile, you have an organic horizon, which is the O horizon. You have an A horizon, which is uh, mixed up organic and mineral layer. And then don't worry about this, underneath you have a B horizon where as the water filters through and takes down small clay particles, they accumulate in the B horizon. So how deep this horizon is from the surface is what's shown here. And so what you can see that an uncut undisturbed soil the depth of the B horizon is twice as much as in the young forest. And that's simply because of all the erosion that took place during these decades or hundreds of years of agriculture. But these old forests are 150 or, or even 200 years old. And yet the soil is, doesn't look like this. So why is that? Why is this, you know, the plants regenerating? We have a healthy looking forest. Why the soil is not going to look like this? And this is where the earthworms essentially come into place. So I'm going to talk a little bit about earthworms. Soil biodiversity first. I always do that because people are, in my opinion, need, usually not aware of the enormous diversity of life that uh, lies under our feet. And that's essentially is why it's called a poor man's rainforest, especially in the temperate regions and especially in, in forested soils. The, the number of species per unit area can actually be higher than um, in a tropical rainforest. And so we get all kinds of things for the tiniest bacteria to the largest, and we have many of them. So these are just typical numbers of individuals. This is 10 million protozoans that typically found in one square meter forest soils. So here are the earthworms in this pot worm and, and earthworm category. And of course, earthworms are uh, what we call a keystone group because it its borrowing and feeding activity affects just about every possible soil property, biological, 
physical and chemical soil proper. So wherever they occur, they make a huge difference. And most of these things we consider to be so, so-called good things, right? This is why we like them. We want them in our garden. So earthworms are a fairly diverse group. And they are, as you can see in these photos, are not just your typical sort of pinkish, you know, bluish things that we dig out in our gardens. They can differ in terms of color, size. It's a very old group of, you know, a phylum called annelids. We have about 5,000 species, which doesn't mean that we don't know what the actual species, total species richness is, because many species have not been found and or described. And But what we know is about 80 of these species are what we call peregrine earthworms. So what that means is that these species like, you know, they thrive in human environment. That means usually in disturbed sites as well. And they move around with humans. Humans move them around, essentially. And this is how they get introduced. And so I'm going to talk about two of these groups, two families related to these two two waves of earthworm invasion, as we call them, the Lumbricidae, These are the common night crawlers, or again, common things that we find in our garden. And the Asian jumping worms, the family Megascolesidae, that is a bigger concern today. So earthworms can be really large. This is the largest known earthworms. The giant gypsum earthworm lives in Australia in wetlands. And these are earthworms in Ecuador, highlands. This is their cocoon. So these are big enough to make a meal. This is my former professor in Hungary and my colleague, uh, a taxonomic expert in the Hungarian Museum of Natural History. We call, we, we divide them into functional groups because the earthworms do, do different things and different groups or different species have different effects on all those functions that I mentioned. So some of them only live close to the surface and feeds on leaf litter. Others like this giant gypsum Australian worm lives deep in the soil and doesn't come to the surface. And again, others build these vertical burrows and pull leaf litter into them like these night crawlers. So I want to mention we do have native earthworms uh, up as of today, about 120 uh, described species. Native earthworms are really understudied in North America. They are taxonomically challenging group, um, especially this one. This is a different family, but because they are understudied, we can actually find new species new to science, which is what this species is that we found in Plumber's Island. They are very different as you can, they are very long, sort of spaghetti-like and they move differently, a little biary. Or uh, this is another species new to science that we found in Pennsylvania in a a hunting ground. Uh, This belongs to the same family as these European earthworms, Lumbricidae. So in addition, of course, we have these two groups, as I mentioned, I'll talk a little bit first about these European species, 32 European species are known in North America, two are them shown in here. And so these European species, well, this first wave of earthworm invasion originates by this Lumbricidae, And they came, you know, species originate from Europe, but it doesn't mean that they were always introduced from Europe. Members of this peregrine group are now found every continent. So they were introduced and with the global trade, they were probably coming and going many different times to that from different ports to different ports on the ships. But early on, they definitely came from Europe, probably by plants that immigrants brought. Most importantly, we don't think about this often with ship ballast, uh, which was used, soil was used as ship ballast on early ships that came empty and went back with all the trees that were cut down and other goodies from North America, and also exchanges in, in nurseries and in botanical gardens. Often people ask, so how do we know if a species is native or introduced? And one uh, clue, I mean, you, you, you have to know the biogeography and the origin of these groups. And so what we know in North America is, and you might have 
heard about this, that obviously uh, the ice age, the repeated ice ages had an important effect on species distribution. So clearly when the last ice age, that's the latest glacier boundary, everything was killed here. And then as the, the glacier was moving back, plants and animals followed and colonized these newly exposed lands, but earthworms are very slow colonizers. So most of the native earthworms, if not all of them, are found south of this glacier boundary. So this is one of them. This is These two species belong to the same family, Lombricidae, but this one is a native species. We have two, or actually a genus just, but we have two species in this genus in North America, and they only occur in North America. Whereas these peregrine earthworms, these non-native earthworms, as you can see, are thriving, colonize huge areas north of this glacier boundary, which is an indication that people brought them there. And also they have this, gene, this junk distribution, which is an indication that introduction happened several times, you know, as ships were coming to the east, ships were going to the west coast. And so earthworms were, uh, you know, sort of spreading from those entry points independently. The other approach to do to this is molecular techniques, which we more recently, you know, more frequently use. So what you can see here, this is the molecular phylogeny. So using DNA uh, sequencing, these are the native Lumbricidae species in North America. And these, a bunch of these are non-native ones, not all of them. These are the introduced peregrine ones, but these are different. So what we found is that two of those species, people thought they were actually introduced to North America, but as it turns out, they're much, much closely related to native species here, which is an indication that they are actually native to North America. And they were then from North America introduced to all over the world. And that is interesting because many, many years ago, a geologist, now retired geologist, Donald Schwert, um, published a paper and it says he found a cocoon in deep lake sediments and he dated that sediment 14,000 years. And he said it was a cocoon of this species and nobody believed it because everybody thought that this is a non-native species. And so they thought he must have, you know, got the wrong, idea or the wrong um, sample or something like that. But this is a, a, another piece of information supported that this species indeed was here before the last ice age. Okay, so at CERC, we continuously monitor the species. And as you see, we have some native species. These are the blue ones, but most of them are not native. And so in 2007, as you see, most of them were this European first wave of earthworm invasion, Lumbricidae. But in the, a few years later, we found that uh, there are now these Asian species as well, uh, which we didn't find found earlier. So this is definitely an ongoing invasion process. So how do earthworms, so what effect do they have? So there are lots and lots of papers, especially from uh, the northern, you know, Minnesota and upstate New York and, and uh, Michigan and all those forests where there are no native earthworms. So here it's different because we have a mixture of the two. But up north, you can sort of much easier, much more easily observe the invasion of these species because you actually can see an invasion front. So you can look at what the conditions were before and after. And so these are still our study from CERC. We found that they are negatively affect orchid seeds. Uh, these are native orchids. Uh, they're not very showy, but nonetheless, they're native orchids. We know that they, because they feed on a lot of leaf litter, the leaf litter dynamics and the carbon input dynamics, because that's the major carbon input annually into the soil coming from the leaves that fall. If you have in a, in a forest where you have a lot of earthworms, these are days in the field of these litter bags almost all of them are gone by next year when the earthworms are present and half of them are consumed by earthworms or 
uh, absent. So these are consumed by other soil organs. Because these earthworms have a very strong mixing action, they put the, they transport the carbon much deeper. So in soils where this is the uncut forest, where there are no earthworms, most of the carbon is in this form on the top of all layer. And it looks like this. When you have a lot of earthworms, there's a lot of feeding and moving and, and mixing by turbation. So the, 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 the O layer doesn't exist. And then instead you have this much more homogeneous A horizon. These data come from our urban forest remnant studies. So this is not from CERC. We are looking at various urban, suburban, and rural forest patches. And so what we find that the more earthworm we have, the more compacted the soil is, the less deep, the, the, the shallower the leaf, the, the leaf litter layer, and less you have less organic matter. And so these figures come from what we call a review paper, which uh, I didn't do, but here's the, the citation. So these studies essentially, the, these, this paper looked at several studies and what they found is that with this, the loss of this whole layer and with this mixing, you have a lot less diversity of soil organisms as well. We tend to think of them as good thing, but depending on what you consider good and what you consider bad, I think this answer can go both ways. We do know, like I said, a lot about these European Lumpicidae, but there is this other group, Megascolecidae, or I'm just going to call them jumping worms, which their sort of spreading and colonization that's ongoing and very visible is what we decided to call the second wave of Earthworm. Invasion. In addition to these 32 species that have been, so I have to mention they have been around for hundreds of years in some places, and probably, at least in our area for sure, their presence, they are very well established, and that's related to this clear cutting and agricultural practices that I mentioned that took place at the turn of the last century, that is. And uh, that's probably greatly enhance their establishment because they can be very uh, abundant in crop fields and they just sort of remained in the forests, the, the recovering uh, forest as well. We have these 16 species of Asian species. And again, it doesn't mean that they all came from Asia. So probably again, there were multiple introductions from multiple places in multiple ways. What we know about them is we know about a hundred, oh, sorry, a thousand uh, species or this many species have been described, but especially in the native Asia, again, they are very much understudied. And so I'm sure there's a lot more species that's waiting to be discovered or described or recognized. They occur in many different habitats, but they are some places like in Central Europe, where I, where I come from, they only occur in greenhouses. So for some reason, they're not able to, at least they haven't been so far, able to escape and then make their way into forested areas. And some of these species are uh, withstand extremely harsh conditions. So for instance, in these volcanic calderas, they were found where the CO2 uh, concentration is 20%. And the uh, temperature is over 40 Celsius, which is a hundred and I don't know how many, 110, 15, something like that in Fahrenheit. And there are toxic fumes and toxic elements, and they still survive on those conditions. It's not quite clear why and how. In the US, uh, the first records came a long time ago. So again, it's just they weren't very visible and this invasion hasn't happened back then. From about the 1970s, 80s, when people are starting to see, you know, larger abundances of these herbs and uh, currently 16 species in 38 states have been recognized. So they have all these various uh, funny names, crazy worms, snake worms, and they got this name because they really move their snake like the snake, unlike the, uh, the typical, you know, what we are used to see these 
earthworms with this, you know, worm uh, movement. And we call them jumping worms because of the thrashing movement. So if you sort of start bothering them, they kind of, they can jump up or they start uh, moving their tail up and down and they very often they lose their tail very quickly. These, uh, some of them or the ones we concerned are actually fairly big. So this is 10 centimeters, I believe. Uh, so four inches or even larger. So as I mentioned, they probably were introduced many places. One of the anecdotal anecdotes related to that is this species, Aminta supeyensis, which is easy to recognize because it's a dark green, green color. And people think that this species actually was introduced after the Second World War with the planting of the Japanese cherry trees in the in Washington DC. But in, in a way people start noticing them and it is usually these records and uh, observations and concerns come from gardeners, um, uh, master gardeners, garden clubs, citizen scientists, people observing them, arboretums. And so people are expressing concerns because they see them in large amounts. And so they don't know what they are and what they do and how they should handle this uh, situation. Now, we are especially concerned about these three invaders. The names are not important, but the colors indicate the three different species. So because they are big, like uh, this guy, so they are uh, usually four inches or so. These are localities in North America as of, you know, a year ago or so. And just because these are empty places, it doesn't mean they're not there. It's just there is not a, a record, an established record of them. These are established records from their native Japan. Now, so you can see they're very common. Well, what that's also, that doesn't mean they are very dominant. So they are usually not as easy to notice. So they don't reach high abundances in forests. Most of the time they found in ditches, disturbed areas. They're also smaller we don't know why in, in Japan than in North America. So I want to show you, this is a paper that just got published, a review paper that sort of gives a, a general view of their ecology, natural history, what we know in North America. And I will put reference at the, um, on my last slide if, if uh, anybody wants to would like to read it. So we noticed that even in, at CERC, uh, this is a, one of our study plots. And so in 2011, they were just sporadically there and even three years, they were, there was a lot more occurrences of this grid sampling. So one of the problems uh, with this group is that unlike the European ones, which is relatively easy to identify from external characters, and we usually use reproductive organs, external reproductive organs to identify them, these animals, for the most part, are what we call parthenogenetic. So that means they don't have to mate they don't exchange sperm, earthworms are hermaphrodites. Rather, this one individual essentially is just popping out uh, cocoons, which are genetically identical to it. Because of that, the organs, the reproductive organs that would be important are degraded. So we, we don't know what species we look at. And that's why these records very often are incorrect, or people just say, well, we saw these you know, Asian earthworm or jumping birds, but they don't know what species we're looking. This is why we also wrote a paper, an illustrated key that tries to address this, at least for the species that are common in North America or so far have been recorded. And hopefully people will find it useful to, to get the species because we really need the species record to get a better idea of where they are and how they are spreading. One way to distinguish at least these two species is the size of cocoons. One of them is much smaller than the other, but of course these are tiny, tiny, tiny cocoons. And you can only get them if you do a lot of sieving and washing, which is a lot of work. Also people who study them establish that the cocoons are super hardy. So very cold to very warm temperatures, they are viable, which is probably part of their being successful colonizer, and also they produce a lot of cocoons. The other sort of unique and different aspect of their natural history is they are annuals. 
So earthworms usually live for several years. These guys come out as juveniles. Usually we start to see them in, in April, um, mostly as small juveniles, like an inch or even less than an inch, small earthworm just wiggling about. And then they start growing. And so, so midsummer, we start to see the adults and there are more and more adults. And these adults then produce this large number of cocoons. And usually by the end of October, they go. So they grow to these big sizes and then they disappear. This is, they essentially die. And the cocoons overwinter and then they hatch again in spring and then the whole cycle starts. Yeah. What you see is this is a study that we're done in Vermont. In day 100, mid-April, I guess, you start seeing them larger and larger abundances. These are still juveniles, and then they become more adults. The juveniles decline. And then again, by sort of mid to late fall, everybody disappears. So and this cycle goes on from year to year to year. So you don't collect them in the winter. You can collect European earthworms in the winter, but not these guys. Lots and lots of papers have been published about the European earthworms and their effects on the biology, uh, mostly the physics and biogeochemistry of the soil. Very, very few papers are available for these jumping herbs. For instance, we have these very complicated things. I told you earthworms are key groups. And as they feed, they are moving in the soil, they cast, so which means pooping. Essentially, they affect what's happening in the soil. And indirectly, they happening what's happening, uh, uh, they affect what's happening with the plants as well. But we don't know, we just don't have, we have huge knowledge gaps regarding on their effect, soil biology and biochemistry. What we know, so one thing that we know, and this is how we recognize them, whether we see the worms or not, is their cast. Their cast is very distinctive and you can see them in your garden. Their cast, unlike European cast, are this loose granular stuff. So they look these little rounded things. They, they, they look like really good stuff that you, you buy when you buy, um, you know, the earthworm cast from uh, gardener supply or something. So they produce the same kind of cast, but unlike the European worms, which would then move up and down and mix this up, thing up, they just deposit that for the most part on the soil surface. And because it's a low stuff, it's very prone to erosions. One potential effect of these earthworms is, is loss of nutrients and loss of carbon because of this loose stuff that doesn't bind very well. It doesn't form these strong aggregates that the European earthworms form with the mineral soil. We don't know, among other things, how, how they are going to interact with uh, in, in areas where there is a well-established European earthworm community. That is one is going to push the other one out. We do have some lab results. My student did some experiments and they found that these Asian worms seem to push at least the litter feeders out. So seem to be a better competitor for leaf litter. But at the same time, these big, relatively big native species seem, doesn't seem to bother. So it seems to survive quite well under these conditions. Another sort of mystery, if you will, I mentioned these three species that we are following because they seem to be the most aggressive, if you will, invaders, and they're also largest. What, for the most data that we have, these are different colors indicating different species. They occur together. So how, why, why do they co-invade, so to speak? Uh, is, it, is there an underlying reason? Maybe they facilitate each other or, or what's going on? We really don't know. Lots of other questions, for instance, we don't know, as I mentioned, what impact they have on the short and long term. Why is it that in some regions, as I mentioned, they are not able to invade? Whether these earthworms that have been around here, how they are different in terms of the, their genetic makeup, their ecology, their natural history from 
the, the native species, the species in, in Japan and other parts of Southeast Asia. And so often, we, often we, we observe that they invade, you know, if we find them in certain years in huge number and then they disappear. So what is going on, we, we don't know. As I mentioned, or I hope I could show you some data showing that when we take a piece of soil samples, it's, it's not just, even if it's a naturally occurring or, or it appears that it's it's, it's a natural ecosystem, such as a forest. That soil still might reflect some of the past land use legacy, especially in this mid-Atlantic region, but went through various uh, land use change events. The, definitely the jumping worms are a major concern because they are very visible and they're rapidly expanding. Fortunately, I mean, this is one of the questions that Many of you probably want to know, is it, is it possible to get rid of them? And the answer is pretty much no. What we can do, we could try manage or keep their numbers low, but that's even, even that is an extremely difficult task, especially if there are no statewide policies addressing, it, which they aren't in Maryland, but they are some other states. For instance, there are legal restrictions of movement of these species. You cannot move them across state boundaries and you cannot bring in soil and you cannot bring in plants. And there are other restrictions regarding plant exchanges and, and so I would be happy to answer any questions. And I just want to mention, this is my email here, if you would like to email me. And these are two papers that we recently published about these Asian worms. This one is, again, an, an overview of their biology, the current status in North America, and some issues related to management. And this other one addresses a little the management of, in, a, in a greater detail, but it also talks about you know, how we can recognize them, collect them, if we want to experiment with them in a laboratory, how we can do that, how we preserve them. So all sorts of tools to, to study them at different levels. So with that, I thank you. And if you have any questions, which I can see you do, so I'll, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Kathy, for a very informative presentation. Many people asked about predation. Are there birds or other predators in Japan that keep the population in check? What predators have been observed on these worms here? There are very, very few data on this. That is true. So there's essentially no or non-existent data in their native habitats. People just started to study them, and most of the studies are addressing taxonomy, the molecular phylogeny, biogeography, because it's a complicated, very complicated group, and not a whole lot their ability uh, or their ecology, so to speak. As I mentioned, so this is one of the big mysteries. You find them, they are smaller there, and you find them in ditches. But in forests, you find other species, other native jumping worm species there. If this is the scenario, it's probably those species which are, you know, naturally occurring in those forests, or it's more like a competition issue. Now, what eats them? So here, again, there's no good comparisons. I have, I work with a student in Rutgers University who is studying a snake, the uh, decays brown snake. Uh, so this snake is very common in urban areas. And um, one of the main diet items for uh, this species is earthworms. And so he's now doing experiments to look into whether or not they're feeding on the Asian earthworms. They're clearly feeding on the European ones, because we found you can study them, regurgitate them, you find them in their stomach. Birds, so they are dif more difficult to catch for sure than um, the European worms. And there are, again, some anecdotes that never been looked at in a more scientific or more thoroughly, that it's possible that the, the slime that so these slimy material that the Asian earthworms produce are much less well, sort of unpleasant taste. The taste is not so good. So maybe they are not as good bird food as the European ones. But I, again, these are just anecdotes. So we really don't know. Another questioner asked, 
whether any biocontrols have been tried? No, not that I know of. In the second paper, there are a bunch of things that have been listed, mostly physical or chemical. People looked at, people looked at the effect of different pesticides on them, and which is very undesirable for a number of reasons. And so some was more effective in killing them than others, but I mean, it's clearly this is not something that would work in a forest. Uh, they also looked at things like diatomaceous earth, which you know, people use for to control slugs and so on. They don't seem to be effective against earthworms. They looked at some other materials, which were again somewhat effective, such as sulfur, you know, lots of sulfur or coffee ground. But again, I mean, that's not sustainable on a, on a large scale, as a large scale way of controlling well, so how do they spread? So that's maybe an important part of the discussion. How do they get into the forest? One way of spreading these earthworms is via mulch. People have found that mulch, because they're also very good composting worms, actually. They eat a lot of leaf litter and produce these casts, but they produce their cocoons, their large number of cocoons, which then can be spread with the mulch. These many, many tiny cocoons, long, you know, you put the forest trails, this mulching, that's a good way to, to spread them. But if you, if you expose the compost to very high temperature, over 40 degrees for several days, that probably will kill the cocoons. And so that's, that seems one way of, you know, at least mitigating the problem. There are a couple of questions about the cocoons. Yeah. One person says, um, I do not understand your use of the word cocoon. Is it an encapsulated infant or an instar or an egg or an egg mass or what? Sorry. Another person asks, at what depth are the cocoons found in the soil? Oh, sorry about that. So earthworms, when they mate, there is this clitalum, there is this ring on it. So when they mate or they don't mate, here's another one. They essentially, being hermaphrodite, they exchange sperm. And the sperm fertilizes the eggs. and this fertilized eggs will be deposited into this ring, this clitalum. And during the, the reproduction peak, this ring is essentially coming off of the worm. And in these rings are these, you can look at them as eggs, but they are much more hardy than an, than an egg. So again, it's usually there's one animal in this egg, in this cocoon. It's just an encapsulated yeah, egg. Let's put it that way. They deposit this and it can, for instance, just go, that's another way of spreading the earthworms with the runoff. So if they deposit that on the soil surface, water can wash it down to the streams and the streams can carry them somewhere else, deposit it in, so, in a floodplain somewhere else, and then it can hatch over there. So these cocoons can survive for a long period of time before, uh, before the earthworm hatches. But yeah, so these are small things that contain one or several baby earthworms eventually. If you find them, should you kill them? Well, it's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to kill them, you can. Why would you want to kill them? So again, um, after sort of midsummer, so when they start becoming really large and become adults, and you start seeing this, if you see this, that means you have an adult. And that adult is capable of reproducing and depositing these cocoons. So if that happened already, you can kill these animals, but you know, hundreds of cocoons are already in the soil. And by the way, how deep they are. So they very close to the surface, usually up to the few inches, you know, up on the surface or below a few inches. They are tiny, so they clearly can move down with the water, but not too deep. If you find them, you can kill. Th th that is, it's probably are not going to make any difference either way. Difference either. Several people have asked whether there is any mechanism or place to report sightings, and oh, yeah. whether it's useful to do that. Yes, absolutely. 
Yes, yes, yes. In this second paper, so there, there is a thing all IMAP invasives. There is a thing called iNaturalist. If you just type iNaturalist, there are places where you can you can report them. And I think it's probably changes from state to state. Fortunately, Maryland doesn't have the statewide reporting system, but other, other states do have that. Yes, do a post of IMAP, IMAP naturalist or IMAP invasives. You can also, I think people, I think here, is that the Morton Arboretum? So anyway, uh, University of Wisconsin, uh, there are people who work actively collecting these records. If you if you Google invasive jumping worms or something, you will find places where you can report them. Like I said, unfortunately not in Maryland, but... Um... Uh, people have asked how to access your two papers. They're not open access, I, unfortunately. However, some of them are that I cited here. For instance, the, the paper on how to identify them, that is open access. If you, if you really want it, just email me and I'll send you a PDF. I, I, unfortunately, I'm, because of copyright issues, I cannot openly post them. But, but if you write me, I'm, I'm happy to send you a PDF. And another person asked about bibliography. So in these papers, there are, there are links to this IMAP invasives and some other uh, you know, monitoring sites. If you email me, please put the subject line, something that tells me asking for jumping burn paper or something very specific. Because if, if I don't know who emails me, sometimes... I, I not necessarily open open up. Like we get so many junk emails. So just make sure you you clearly indicate that you want these papers or some other information about them. Our next question is: How do earthworms interact with fungal mycelia in the soil? Do they eat them or do they work around them? They don't work around them. So they definitely feed them. Either they feed them accidentally or sometimes purposefully. That's one of the way they interact. The other one sort of indirect interaction is obviously as they move around, they can spread the spores of these uh, fungi. And the third is, which is very often we observe is physical disruption of the mycelia. So the movement of the earthworms often disrupt fungal mycelia, which is, one sort of undesirable effect of these invasive earthworms because in places where there are no earthworms or just native earthworms, which are very low in abundance, you have these very thick fungal layers. Often uh, with high abundance of non-native earthworms, the, the fungal biomass declines and often the microbial, I mean, the uh, bacterial my, my, uh, biomass will increase. Why have non-native earthworms not invaded the never cut sands as inferred by the soil profile, which are presumably close to the sands which were cut? That's a good question. So one reason is that these never cut stands are in peninsulas or more isolated, but still that's not a good enough reason because we have islands at the Smithsonian in the water where people brought them in and they are happily there. So one barrier, one big barrier is soil pH and earthworms generally do not like very acidic soils and these are fairly acidic soils. I will say never say never, so I don't know <laughs> if it can happen in the future or not, but yeah, a combination of, of physical isolation and the very low pH. Uh, another person would like to know whether earthworm invasions correlate with areas with a lot of invasive plant species, and if so, how? Yeah, so there are conflicting data on this. Some people have shown that they have what we call a synergistic event or effect on each other. So which means that the plants create conditions which are better for the earthworms and vice versa. So they sort of reinforce their presence or each other's presence but not 
everybody agrees. What we can say is probably some of it is related that these both of the invasive plants and invasive earthworms do well in disturbed areas. If it has been cut down or is, is its edges, so very often we find a lot of invasive plants on edges of forests or other ecosystem, partially because this is how they spread, obviously, but partially because the conditions, the light conditions and so on are different. So I think disturbance is one of the common de denominator. In some cases it's possible, but that's not generally the case, not true. There's a question from a gardener about plant swaps. Are they advisable? Do you have any advice about swapping seedlings? The advice is to swap them without soil. Bare root plant swapping is the desirable way of trying to, to put a break on, on, on their distribution or spreading. So that's a very clear answer. Exchange your plants with bare roots, no soil. I think it's that I think in, in some of these states that I mentioned, I think it's it's mandatory now. They cannot swap plants in in you know pots or soil. Uh, is there a field guide to identify the families, genera, and species of earthworms in North America? No, there isn't. <laughs> there are, so everybody makes his or her own little guide. So like I said, the paper, and that's available, open access, this paper in Zootoxa, I, I believe, that it, is, it is open access. That has a, a guide, a, a pictorial guide, so photos of the thirst rooms and some features people can look for. There's probably more than maybe gardeners want to know because it, it, it talks about all the species, uh, all the 16 species, and not all of them are very common. Fortunately, there is one little booklet which called the Great Lakes Worm Watch Guide or something, a little booklet, and it might even be available in, in Amazon still. This was published a long time ago, and it's a simple, small booklet uh, on the European earthworms that occur in the Great Lake region, which is not all of the earthworms, no, not all of the non-native earthworms, but most of them are. So that's a, a fairly easy to use guide. And you might find some on the internet as well, some simple ID keys. In a place like Cirque, a reforested area south of the maximum Glacial extent, how does the abundance of introduced earthworms of all species compare to the abundance of native worms? Ah, yeah, so native worms, so first of all, regardless of in our latitude, regardless of the presence of the non-native earthworms, native earthworms are of very low abundance. So it, it, it's what they are. So it has nothing to do with introduction or being pushed out or anything like that. It's just that they're very, of very low abundance for some reason. The further south you go, the higher the abundance of native earthworms is going to be. Now, the, the, some of those species at CERC are occurring only in very specialized environments. So some of the species are only in wetlands, riparian areas, you can find them under logs. And again, this is not because they were pushed out there. This is just their natural history. The, the non-native earthworm abundance is huge. It's really large. And, but, but again, it's probably because this was a, an untapped area. And so they, they didn't have to really compete all that much with the native species. The one species which I showed you, which is the hardy one, I said it as Lombardy, that is pretty hard, that's comparable in terms of its abundance and by abundance, I mean like biomass mostly. And in wetlands, that's also a wetland species, it's huge. In wetland species, this, this native species dominates. The questioner would like to know whether it's true that the deeply incised creek channels in the fall zone between the Piedmont and the um, coastal plain, the, whether the deeply incised creek channels that are attributed to excessive and recent stormwater flow 
are they actually cut through a deep layer of recently deposited surface sediment in floodplains due to severe erosion of farmland upstream from these creeks in the 19th century. Again, I'm not a soil scientist or a geomorphologist, but for in the urban areas, at least what we find, that, yes, you're right, there is these deeply cut channels and it relates to, to stormwater flow. And very often the soil scientists in, in the the Baltimore Ecosystem Study found that you have these, what we call the buried A horizons. So these were the original horizons of, you know, the, the before land use change, you know, reflecting the before land use change conditions. And then they were, the, there are all kinds of stuff layered on the top of it, which is related to increased erosion, which is then related to various land use in urban systems, it's, it's even worse probably. So you, you see this funny kind of horizonation because of that. I personally don't study that, but other people I, I know they do. There's one more question about iNaturalist. And can the iNaturalist AI uh, database distinguish earthworm species if good enough photos are provided? Well, um, I don't think iNaturalist per se can do that, as far as I know. I mean, I, I get very often photos of earthworms from people and asking me what earthworm is that. And in some cases, the answer is relatively easy. And in other cases, it's not possible. So if you really want to be very thorough, you at least need to look at the specimen uh, and then make sure you got the right species. And if in the area of this person or in this habitat, all the earthworms were sampled, belong to two species. One of them is big and red and the other one is small and white. Then from that on, you can be pretty sure that you can separate the two. But no, it's not like a bird guide or you know some others which, which would be a, a lot easier to, to do it. So you can only do it if you know what is in your area and what can be similar to what, but often photos, especially if they don't show the right kind of organs, which you have to have a close up, or sometimes they don't show the size. So sometimes I get a photo, but I have no idea if this is a small thing or a large thing. Things can be very similar, so it, it can be very challenging. You, you might be able to say, well, this is a jumping verb. You know, this is an Asian jumping verb, or this is not. But sometimes that's as far as it, it goes reliably. We have addressed all of the questions, at least somewhat. Very interesting presentation and very informative on a topic that many of us didn't know much about. Thank you very much, Kathy. Okay, great. Uh, thanks again. Thanks for inviting me. And please just contact me if you have any questions or concerns. So I'll be happy to answer the best I can. So thanks, everyone.